How do you introduce a man who brought you into full-time ministry? How do you introduce a man who baptized you? How do you introduce a man that has spent countless hours on his knees praying with you at 6.30 in the morning in the snow where no one wants to come out of their house and you'd be waiting there with a smile on his face? How do you introduce a man who is the same when he's preaching or when he's at home with his children? How do you introduce a man that has treated you like a son and been like a father? How do you introduce a man who gave you the pulpit and gave you the mark long before you deserved it or you were ready? I don't know. I don't know how to introduce that man. So I'm just going to call him my pastor, Steve. If you would come up here, please. Man. Made me cry. Oh, I've never been introduced like that, brother. I love what's, what God is doing. I tell you, the, the older I get... Um, uh, I, there's more joy in seeing, and I, I think there's something we should lay hold of in this day, and it's just to be able to see people's gifts and take joy in seeing people run, you know, and getting behind them and, and pushing them on, encouraging them, and whatever God has for them, and uh, it is a joy. It's been so encouraging to hear what God has been doing here, and, and just to watch uh, Brent, Brent take off and have him come back and share stories, it's, it's, it's a joy, brother, so thank you for that uh, Boy, what, a, what an introduction. Um, we uh, are here. Uh, I, I swore I would never come back to Texas in August. I've done a pretty good job, <laughs> except uh, we're dropping our daughter off at Baylor. It's a new, big, uh, yeah. The Baylor Nation is alive here. Um, so we're excited. Big transition in the Woodrow household with uh, Megan being our first to head off to college. So we're excited to take her tomorrow. And uh, It's a joy to, to be here. Uh, among everyone. I bring greetings from your brothers and sisters in Aspen, Colorado, who love Jesus. And uh, yes, there is a growing number of people who love the Lord in Aspen, Colorado. Believe it or not, it is happening. God is, his church is, is growing, all right, and with excitement. And uh, that was, uh, we, we sure miss the whole Phillips crew being among us. When they walk into a place, into a community, and this is testimony to it, they bring faith and expectation with them. They raise the level of expectation. Folks, that should be the case for all of us. Wherever we walk into our businesses, into our home, we should bring the presence of God. And when you bring the presence of God, you bring uh, the, the, the uh, possibility that anything, is possible with us. And, and not just some fake thing, journeying with people, journeying with one another with the realities of trauma and tragedies in life, but a real sense, right, that God is with us. He wants to do great things uh, among us. And, uh, and that's why he sent his, his son, right, for us, to, to redeem us. Um, we had a lot of fun. We missed them around uh, our, our place. I haven't got any uh, emails from famous people asking me to lunch in a long time. Um, you don't want to get into a prank war with somebody who is a, a tech genius. Uh, you'll always lose in the midst of that. And I was humiliated in actually calling back some of those people thinking that they really did want lunch with me. Um, but uh, we had a lot of, <laughs> yeah, we could tell stories. And the hunting story, I remember being out with him, his first shot, and he first shot, he shot this hog, and it was an amazing shot. Uh, actually, while we were actually moving, you know, and, and he looked over and he just said, hey, Halo works, you know. Uh, so, I don't know, hunters, maybe a little practice on Halo video games might uh, be somewhat uh, useful in the process. But uh, miss you all, and uh, it's exciting to see what, what God is doing, folks. And um, I want to talk to you this evening about friendship with God, friendship with the Lord. Uh, an incredible thing when you think about it, that God, uh, who, who created us, wants to know us. He wants to journey with us deeply, and he wants to know us. And I just ask you this morning, is just taking a look at your friendships, your life, how important are friendships to you? I mean, how, how important to your life are friendships? And it's very important, I think, that we should evaluate our lives. A lot of the times, the things we look at to look at the quality of our life, we, we just bypass the idea of friendships. We don't spend too much time uh, just diving in and just evaluating the quality, the depth, and quantity of my friendships. 
There's a lot of secular research out there. Um, maybe some of you are in tune with this idea of the economics of happiness. I, I never realized there was such a thing, but it's quite a big growing area of, of formal study in economics called the economics of happiness. And they have all these theories. Uh, so secular research actually shows, and if I remember, I think one of these things is called the Easterlin box, if anybody's in tune with all that, but basically shows from research that the more money people make, the more fluence, basically, that people make, it does not equate to being more happy. Actually, all the research shows that after, they say, after your basic needs are met and your health, you're relatively healthy, uh, that just adding more stuff, more money, more affluence to your life does not increase your happiness. Now, that's kind of a shot, isn't it, to, to what research shows, especially in the American experience and everything else? Wow, it doesn't really improve life. We look at our lives and it's just boring, isn't it? Without friendship, I mean, doing it alone, on your own, life gets really boring and myopic really quick, doesn't it? When you think about it, friendships in our lives, those are the things that open doors. I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for friendship with, with Brent. And I look back at friendships and open all kinds of doors, wonderful opportunities with certain friends, things I could never do on my own, or opportunities getting into amazing places, amazing adventures. Life gets big, right, when we engage in deep relationship based with, with purpose in life. Boy, when we don't have friendships, we don't have deep, lasting friendships, life turns inward, and it gets real small. And folks, when life turns inward, and I, I do not have solid, heart-level friendship in my life, you know, I'm exposed to all kinds of, of things in life. Uh, my heart is exposed. We're exposed to all kinds of dangerous bondages, right, that can come and take hold of, of our life. Maybe you've heard of this, this theory one degree from separation is, is what I'm titled it tonight. But the theory, and there's a movie about it and everything, six degrees of separation. Anybody heard of that theory, six degrees of separation? The theory goes that, and the movie was made about it and several other things, that you, know, uh, you can link together anybody. The theory is that anyone anywhere can link together six people, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, and you can join any, person, any two people in the world. And uh, anyway, there's been all kinds of research even with that. Uh, theory. But what an amazing thing to think about, folks, that if you know God, if you're in friendship with your Creator, and you're in deep, intimate, growing, trusting fellowship with God, there's only one degree of separation between you and all things being possible. Every need, every desire, every dream everything that God put into your heart for you, the desires of your heart, is that you don't have to depend on and get in the rat race of, of going through this person or using this person or getting in competition with this person or whatever. It's just a freedom. A freedom from, from misusing relationships because you're in fellowship with God. And you're in tune with what God is doing, how he's created you. You expect God is going to lead you in what David called the everlasting way. So what I want to do tonight is talk to you about this one degree of separation from all things being possible. When we step into and understand this idea of friendship with God, and folks, that's an overwhelming thing that we don't think about too much. The God of the universe, the one who created you, uniquely you and all the universe, he wants friendship with you. He wants a deep, abiding relationship with you. I just think even within our, our church circles and everything, we've done, I think, a lousy job of discipling, equipping people, showing people how to walk and step into that relationship and how to really live in that abundance. Remember, Jesus came to give life and to give it abundantly and to be about the Father's business, to have insight into what God is doing and being a vessel for him in this dark, broken world to see amazing things happen, not because of who we are, because of God. Remember, Jesus promised streams of living water right, flowing through our hearts. God's power, his love, his ministry through the hearts of his people to one another and to the ends of the, ends of the earth. So I want to talk to you briefly tonight. And hopefully that faith will increase and God will move among us and expand our hearts tonight 
with a new passion, a new sense of zeal, a new overwhelming sense that not only does God want friendship with us, but God wants to invite us into what he's doing. He wants to actually live through us. He wants to present and represent his son, Jesus, through us into every sphere of influence that we have out there. So before we dive in, let me just pray for our time. Father, we come to you. Jesus, let me tonight make much of you, Lord. God, let us lift up your name, your word, you promise. It doesn't return void. And Lord, this gathering together, Lord, it's not about just attaining more intellectual knowledge. That's important. But God, unless you move, Holy Spirit, we, we trust that you say when your people gather together, you're among us, and you will do amazing things. You will meet the needs of your people who cry out to you, God. We trust you. Holy Spirit, I pray you'll move in this place. Lord, I pray you'll do something with friendships. Those who are here tonight, Lord, who are struggling, Lord, who don't have a, a, a friend, someone who knows their heart, who knows what's going on deeply inside them, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray you'll touch them tonight. God, that you will restore, you will bring hope, God, that you will provide, Lord. I've seen you, Lord. I give testimony to thee throughout my life, God, asking for good friendships, and Lord, you providing. Abundantly, Lord. Well, come meet us. Let your word, Lord, sink deep within our hearts tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I want to read a couple passages before we dive in this morning. Uh, or this, um, it's been a long day. Uh, I uh, recently took uh, the kids uh, on a, uh, actually Megan didn't get to go, but our four other kids uh, on a backpacking trip. Uh, we're outdoor family. We went to Wyoming to the Wind River Range, which is grizzly territory. It's quite exciting. Beautiful, rugged terrain, just amazing, amazing country. And uh, we backpacked in several miles and, and with another family. Just had a, a great time up there. And I did something different that I've never done before. I think sometimes with God's Word, we, we, uh, we read, read big chunks of it, and that's important. But I just took one verse. It's this Psalm 25, verse 14. And the whole time we're out, I didn't read anything else but I just meditated on that one, one verse. I asked God, Lord, make this verse alive. Let me go deep into this verse. Let me understand what you're saying in this one verse. And so every morning, I get up early, get my coffee, and go out among these amazing views and, uh, and just talk to God about this one verse. Um, sometimes we're just so into a routine or other things. I encourage you, sometimes just... Camp out, maybe even for multiple weeks or a month in, in one small section and let God sink it deep within you. Uh, the best way to memorize scripture is when that scripture, you know that God has personally spoken to you. Personally spoken to you through that passage. It's not just God's word, it's not just his truth, but there's a, a real personal uh, message of that passage into your heart. This is Psalm 25 verse 14. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. The friendship of the Lord belongs to those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant, his promises. You flip over to the New Testament. John chapter 15, this should be up on the screen. Just starting in verse 14. This is what Jesus said. He says, you are my friends. And folks, if I had time, I'd take you on a journey from Exodus, I mean from Genesis, all the way to the end, to Revelation. I'd show you God's covenant, his, his working from the beginning of time, creating us in his image, doing his covenant, calling his people, working his promises out, showing us the magnitude of sin, showing that he and only he has the solution for that. A heart the core of God is that he desires to dwell amongst, he desires to know us and be in friendship with us. We were created with that capacity for friendship, for intimacy. If those things are not satisfied in our life, we can go off and accomplish all kinds of goals and purposes in life, but if my heart is not awakened to this deep need for intimacy, friendship, community, we were created to be in community with the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit, an incredible intimate friendship. So Jesus says, you're my friends. 
if you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For the servant, listen to this, does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your shoot fruit should abide. In other words, it should remain. It should be eternal. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you will love one another. I've grown more and more to realize that the lack of love is a direct indicator that there's a lack of friendship with God. If there's a church, a community of, of God's people, and there's a lack of love, a lack of care among one another, and that blossoms outward, it is, it is an intimacy problem. It's a friendship problem. This evening, I just have two questions for you. I pray you'll take these questions and uh, that you really think on them. You'll take these two passages and you'll really take some time with God to wrestle with, Lord, these promises are amazing. I want to step into and really experience what friendship with you is all about. The first one of these questions is this. Is our fear of God, is it under God's grace? Or is it under law? There's a lot of talk about the fear of God. Some people, they go to the New Testament and it says that love, pure love, they'll pass out all fear. In other words, there is a wrong kind of fear, and we'll talk about that. But the scripture is clear from the beginning to end that God's people should revere, there should be a healthy fear of God. And uh, I think for a lot of people, they're not sure what that looks like. Uh, so the question is, is, is our fear of God, is it under grace or is it under law? You see, if my fear of God is under, under uh, grace, that draws me to God. Right? The scripture says we're to boldly go before the throne of God's grace. But if my fear of God, if it is under the law, and we can go back and forth on this, if it's under the law, if it's under condemnation, if it's, if it's under guilt and shame and these kind of things, if those are a part of the equation, you know what happens is I step back. I step away from God. I step back and I'm not sure how to approach him. Grace is the greatest motivator. It's the greatest power that moves us towards God. Realizing he has open arms for us in this whole thing. So the question is, are we, when it comes to our fear and understanding that, is it under the grace or is it under the law? This idea of God's fear being under the law, there's a spectrum. And even all of us tonight, we're somewhere in this, this, this spectrum of, of understanding our fear of God and the extremes on this, on one end of that is, is self-righteousness. And I've been in that camp. Self-righteousness, it means that I, I, I sit in church or among people and, and my main thing is, hey preacher, just give me something I don't know. Give me some more notes. Give me some more theology. Now all that's important, don't get me wrong, it's important that we go after that stuff, but self-righteousness is, is all about what I know. It is priding myself, though I might not even come across that way, but in my heart, really, it's, it's like we see the Pharisees. It's what I know, and it's a subtle, powerful thing. And that's one extreme, right, on, on that side. But, but that is a fear of God that is under the law. In other words, I have a real legalistic thing, and it really keeps me from moving intimately into people's lives is, is my ministry to them is more about a knowledge thing. It's, it's more about really where I'm at, what I know. I know more than you. And that spiritual growth is, is strictly just an increase in knowledge. Now the other end of that spectrum is, is really, a, a, I would call it just self-deprecation. Right? It, it would be a lack of self-worth. It would be a, a sense of just being under shame. I'm not worthy. That, that's an aspect of the fear of God, is that, God, I'm not, I'm not worthy to, to, to approach you, is, is, is oh, I've messed up. And, and uh, all of us, folks, in one way or another, have swung in this thing in one way or another in the sense that we have a, a wrong view of the fear of God, this reverent 
holy God that we revere and we honor and that we realize, wow, the, this chasm, he's closed it. Jesus has torn the veil. I am to approach the grace, the throne, the presence of God and to leave behind me, be, be convicted of my self-righteousness and be set free from my, my, my self-condemnation. Be set free from holding on to my, my sin, my shame, living under the reality right, of the gospel. A healthy fear of, of God. Um, folks, I, I recently, uh, just actually before I came on this trip, I, I had some new uh, data came across my, my desk uh, about the state of suicide in our country today. And I read these stats, and, and it just it broke my heart. Uh, our, our little valley we live in, it's one of the greatest kept secrets. People don't talk about it. Actually, in this article, it said uh, that it's amazing how few churches actually deal up front with this issue today. And uh, the stats, that, just a couple of them here, I just want to wake you up to the state of people's hearts in our nation today. Every year over a million people attempt suicide. Every 17 minutes someone succeeds. Between 25 and 34 uh, years old, it's the number two killer. And the growing one is 15 to 24. Right now it's number four, but growing quickly. For that, that should just break the hearts of God's people. And to, to wake up and realize that every day, you realize there's people around you who are desperate to be known. And, and in this article, it went on to basically try to explain, why is this happening? What's happening in our country? We're losing our soul. There's, there's, there's a greater and greater sense of, of just emotional fragility going on in our culture today. And the article goes on, and it just ends with saying this thing. It says, these people are desperate to be known. Desperate. There's turmoil going on in their heart, but nobody really knows them. They haven't really shared what's, what's going on deep inside their soul. Every day, folks, there's people around you who are desperate to be known, desperate to be reached out to. You see, God comes to us. He's a God who desires to be known. And for a healthy relationship, it takes both people with open hearts, willing to be known. And God calls his people to step out and not just serve people on the outside, but get below the surface, right into the heart of, of what's going on. Now, the group this size, with all those statistics, and it goes on to say how many people actually contemplate it. Oh, it's just the hopelessness that's, that's taken hold of so many people today. As I pray tonight, if that's you, if you're there, if nobody knows What's going on inside your heart? Do you realize, too, that the thing that just blew me away was the number one church group is Protestant evangelicals for suicide. You know why that is? Back to this fear of God. Back to this shame thing. Is I can't, I can't let somebody know what I'm thinking. I can't really let somebody know, know that, that what's going on inside my heart. Folks, if that's you tonight, you know the first step, I always tell people the first step towards victory, the first step towards freedom. Remember Jesus says, what do you want? You gotta step out in faith and say, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray over me. That's the first step of opening my heart for God to come with his power and, and his, his truth right into my life to transform what's going on inside my soul. Folks, what about you? What about fear of God? Is it under grace? Is it, under, is it a reverent thing coming and wanting to step in daily into his presence and hear from him and what he's doing, allowing him to live in your life? Or are there barriers? Folks, we all have barriers. The question is, how are we going to let those barriers come down? The idea of, of grace the fear of God being under grace. What does that look like? Folks, lately, just in looking at this idea of grace, and what an amazing hymn for tonight. But it just hit me when I was meditating on Psalm 25. 
It just hit me again, this simple but profound reality. God, you didn't have to save me. But you did. You didn't have to reach down out of heaven and grab my heart, open my heart, that I would seek your face. But you did. And you realize that in, and immediately, sometimes people say, oh, well, that's not fair. Folks, if there's anything in my heart that says, God, that's not fair, then I don't understand grace. Grace is God did not have to. It's unmerited favor, but he did. He opened my heart. In this passage in John, right, Jesus goes on and says this. He drives it home, doesn't he? He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I chose you. By God's almighty grace, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit that abides fruit. In other words, that, that has an eternal impact. Now, folks, when we learn the fear of God, to live under his empowering grace, we're no longer satisfied with, with purposes and goals and things in life that, that don't have an eternal aspect to them. In other words, I start living with a whole new perspective on my goals at work, my goals at home, my goals for my children, is I, I want more out of life. I want fruit that lasts. I want to leverage everything I have, right? I just want more. I start getting hungry for God. I don't get, I get not satisfied with things that used to satisfy me because the grace is motivating me. And I have God's eyes. I'm more about God. What is your business here? I'm more empowered with seeing people's hearts come alive and radically changed for him. I'm more, more impassioned to see true breakthrough for people, chains truly broken and tore down. Fear that's under grace, folks, is a fear of God, an honoring God, a revering of God that moves towards God. It's a desire, it's something in my heart that says, I want you, God, I'm going to step towards you in faith. Again, as we said in Hebrews, it's boldly coming before the throne of grace. And it's a pursuing of the fullness of God. It's a pursuing of the Father, the Son, Jesus, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. And what I'm growing to, to understand is is that one of the deficits in developing friendship with God is that we forget that it's really communal. It's three relationships. And, and, and my relationship with the Father, right, it's one God, three persons. The glory of the Trinity, our God. And that all the big relational questions in the world are for intimacy, community, uh, society, all these things, they don't make any sense whatsoever without this beautiful, mysterious Father, Son, Holy Spirit, living in perfect intimacy, right, all together. And in my own life, what I'm seeing is I, I think we're in, in leading one another in a relationship with God. We've, we haven't taught people about your, our relationship with the Father. That's our identity. That's our affirmation that we need from the Father as he affirmed this Jesus. Our, our relationship with Jesus, he's our Savior, right? He's our friend, he says. He's the one that calls us into mission as his church, as his people, carrying out his calling in our life. And then the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. At the end of 2 Corinthians, Paul ends it, and he says, now, as he said, the grace of Jesus, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may they be yours. May they be yours. And I just ask you tonight, in your own walk towards God, has someone led you into intimate fellowship? With the Father and with the Son, Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit. Many of us in our traditions, we might get one or little, you know, we're all, maybe all about Jesus. But to move into the fellowship, the fullness, remember Paul in Ephesians, he writes about the fullness, that we've come into the fullness of God. It can't be done without moving in this incredible uh, walk with all three persons of the Godhead. Jesus comes, he saves us, he introduces us to the Father. The scripture said the Father and the Son pour out the Spirit of God on the church. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God's lifeblood through us 
to continue on the work of Christ in this world. That's the fear of God, a healthy fear of God that is under God's grace. Next question. Just looking at this idea of the friendship of, of God uh, tonight is, I ask you, this idea of Jesus memory calls us, he appointed us to go and to bear fruit that lasts, abiding fruit. In other words, the earlier part of 15 is, is being connected to the vine and, and, and being fruitful and bearing this fruit that lasts. And so I ask you, uh, this evening, are, are you trying to bear fruit for God by greater performance for God or by greater intimacy and friendship with God? I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I grew up performance. I get a lot of kudos for performing well. It's doing more, doing it better for God. But when it comes to, and we can get by with some of that for a while, but, you know, pretty soon we, we head up against certain things Oh, Lord, we need breakthrough here. Whether it be in people's souls, bondage that's going on, relational trauma or issues. Well, we, need, we need, God, we come to a place, I need you to move, I need you to act, Lord. What do I have to do, God, to get breakthrough? And I think too many times, even in the church, and I've been guilty of it in our, all of our traditions, is we just heap upon one another's steps, or just do this, or here's the key, or do that. When, when the, the answer all along is greater intimacy. And Jesus continues to, to make this clear. He modeled it for us in, in how he spent time with the Father, getting the Father's heart early in the morning before he went out in his, in his life. When the disciples came, and they'd been healing, but they came to this one boy, they just could not get him set free. And I remind everybody, Jesus didn't say, boys, sometimes you lose the battle. He did not do that. He said the most amazing thing where he says, this kind. You can't get breakthrough with this kind without what? Greater fasting and praying. In other words, greater intimacy with God. You've got to press into that throne. To have your faith strengthened. Because that one degree of separation is, if you're in friendship with the creator of the universe, all things are possible. The reality is we live in a broken world. Right? And there's constantly this tension between the, the now that I'm experiencing right, and, and the not yet of, of what is promised. And, and God calls us, right, even in the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, right? Lord, your will be on earth as it is in heaven. Right? To bring your will, Lord, through me into this situation to push back the darkness. It says that Jesus came, John tells us, to defeat the works of the devil. And he calls his people to get into that battle. Because you know what? That's how God loved us. That's how Jesus loved us. In verse 12, he says, chapter 15, he says that, that if you love one, um, that you love one another just as I have loved you. How did Jesus model love? I want to take you just on a little scripture journey here as we close. How did Jesus model love? If you read the Gospels, Jesus loved people, the entirety of them. Their physical body, their physical needs, their emotional needs, their spiritual needs. And he loved them by healing the entire person bringing to bear a full renewal and salvation. That Greek word sozo is such a beautiful word. It means a complete renewal and strengthening of every aspect of our body. And uh, I think we've limited the idea, especially I think here in the Bible Belt, we limit this idea of salvation to a prayer someone prays to be saved. It's bigger than that. The gospel's bigger than that. He came to give abundant life. And he calls us to love others as he loved. And so I just want to take you on a little journey here. There's this word, poieo, in the Greek. It's a powerful word. It speaks of God's doing. And so in this passage where uh, we, we see that uh, Jesus says, I know servants, though we will always be bond servants of Christ. Jesus is drawing us in, right, into this partnership. I call you friends. A servant that remains on the outside doesn't know what the master 
what the Father is doing. And Jesus modeled this in John 5 when he says, I do nothing I don't see my Father doing. And so he tells his disciples and all those who follow his name, come with me to the inner sanctum. The veil's been torn. I've done everything it takes to get all of us with all of our mess, all of our junk, set free, cleansed, robed in the righteousness of Christ, to step into friendship with God Almighty. Come with me. And let's see what the Father is doing. And so this word poyoyo is the word used here where it says, uh, the servant doesn't know what the master is doing. I've called you friends because I want to make known to you what the Father is doing. It's through Jesus, this is why he goes on to say, ask me. Go to the Father in my name and ask that you may lay hold of what the Father is doing. This so next message is... You pull up the Ephesians 20 passage. Thank you. It's the same word. Now to him, I'm sure everybody knows this passage. One of my now to him who's able to do, there is the poeo, far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work, where? It's within us. God's doing his work. The Father wants to do his work because he's now declared you a friend. He's now declared that you can move into the throne room of intimacy with God because he wants to carry out his work through his people. Next passage. Hopefully this is a familiar one with you. I just can't get my, my, my mind, heart around the magnitude. You can go to the next John passage. I mean, the magnitude of this promise I think it's time for the church to wake up, church big C, and say, God, your promises, and remember all the way back to the Old Testament, what does he say? The friendship of the Lord belongs to those who fear him, and he will make known to them his covenant, his promises, his will, his desire. And look what Jesus does. I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. Oeo. And greater works than these will he do. Because I'm going to the Father. Those are massive promises. And you know what? I can't go after those without you. The body of Christ, that's why it tells us in, in, second, in 1 Corinthians, is to go after the gift of prophecy. It's not some weird fluting thing out there. It's just encourage one another. Hebrews says, stir up one another. When you come together, push one another on to what God has for you. And yes, we live with, with all kinds of unanswered things, struggles, big issues in life. And, and faith says, I'm not giving up. There's things I'm praying for that haven't got broke, broke, breakthrough yet. I just, Lord, please, breakthrough. Today's the day. But you know, it sure helps when I have someone come along in our church. We're praying for my sister. For her kidneys to come alive. We believe God's going to do that. And uh, we were in the midst of worship, and, and a young man visited from Mexico City. And man, this, he, this young guy, he just encouraged me. He came and said, what can I pray for? And he feels like he has the gift of intercession. And, and every time at church, during prayer service, he'd come put his hands on my kidneys, and he'd pray for my sister's kidneys. Every time I'd see him, he says, that's faith. What does that do to me? It just bolsters me and strengthens to walk in faith. God, please, break through. Are you that to someone else? We need each other to increase our faith. And the last thing, back to our passage, back to our word here, poeo. Intimacy with God. God, what are you doing? Enlarge my heart for greater faith, for greater works. This is why Jesus ends, whatever you ask the Father in my name, oh, why? So that he may give it to you. God wants to, he's our loving Father. He wants to answer our prayers. But he wants our heart. He's not just up there just handing out goodies like a good parent. He wants us to move into his presence and spend time with him. And if our desires 
become his. And wonderful. Y'all come up, worship team. Folks, I'm looking at this idea of friendship with God. Um, Lord, just show me something. That uh, the incredible freedom that comes. For when I really believe there's only one degree of separation to anything being possible in my life, I just have to go to God. Because if I don't do that, I'm easily bound up with comparison. Comparison leads to competition. Competition leads to coveting. And I get all bound up. Friendship with God is the most freeing thing there is in life. It frees your heart. Trust God. He's got good things for you. And He wants to move through you. So tonight, uh, just maybe invite the, worship, the uh, prayer team up. Just encourage and ask you if God's moving tonight. I really felt like when I was praying tonight that, uh, boy, if you're here and you feel like you don't have someone that knows your heart, that tonight, not that you would even have to reveal what's been going on, but that you would come forward and you would just say, pray for me. I need a friend. I need someone to journey with. I can share my heart with and for God to move and bring healing. And the other thing I feel tonight too is just, uh, boy, if you're carrying something again, there's something powerful about saying, pray for me. I've had a hard time trusting God with this issue. Lord, may you break through, bring freedom to me. May I release this to you, God. I trust you. Increase my heart's desire to come after you. Father, we thank you for... Lord, your rich, wonderful blessing. I thank you for your word. And God, I pray for an awakening among your people, Lord. A greater desire to spend time with you, to get your heart. Lay hold, Lord God, of what you're doing. God, I pray that you move tonight. Holy Spirit, that you'd move in this place. Open our hearts. Overwhelm your people, Lord. With your love, your mercy, and your grace. In Jesus' name.